Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now live and I am joined by Canadian film director, Matt Power. Welcome to a conversation with, and I am your humble host, Floyd Marshall Jr. And today we have an interesting show as the title suggests, Life Can Be Stranger Than Fiction, because uh, what we're gonna talk about is a movie that Matt had the opportunity to direct, but how he got that opportunity is life being stranger than fiction. But before we get into that, I'd like to welcome Matt Power, film director out of Canada to a conversation with. We uh, usually go live at 6 p.m., but as you know, life can life. So here we are, no problems, it's all good. Uh, Matt, welcome to a conversation with Sir, how are you? I'm great, Floyd. Thanks you. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, when uh, when you sent me the email and I read it, I said, "Ooh, now that sounds uh, interesting." The way this this film came about, and we're going to jump into that. But before we do, I always like to ask my guests, "How did you get into the film business?" Well, that's a great question. Uh, I started out back in uh, nineteen. 98 and uh, was uh, just a young guy who was interested in you know getting uh, onto uh, whether it be film set or video sets even and I ended up volunteering for a production company in the city where I lived uh, at the time in uh, in a city in western Canada called Saskatoon and thankfully, uh, you know, the staff there were very accommodating and allowed me to come and volunteer with them, even though I was very, uh, you know, green, as they say, and uh, didn't know a whole lot. But uh, it was an opportunity for me to learn and to get some real world experience. And uh, I started out doing sound and uh, eventually got behind the camera and was really just willing to do whatever they had, uh, you know, available for me to do. And it was during that time that I realized that that was really what I wanted to do, what I was passionate about. And uh, from there, you know, I've had uh, other opportunities throughout my career to, you know, work in both film and, and video and uh, uh, took some uh, formal training at a a college uh, here in Ontario, Canada, and uh, you know it's it's been uh, a great uh, experience and adventure for me. And I, I always go back to those early days volunteering, and I think that it would be something that I'd recommend to anybody. You know, if you're interested in film, look for opportunities to volunteer and to gain some of that real world experience because there's so many things that you can learn by being on a film set that you honestly just aren't going to get in school. So yeah, for me, it was a, a, a great way to learn it. And for me to also figure out that that's really what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and I guess to also figure out exactly which discipline you wanted to, mm -hmm. to, to master, because, you know, film sets, you have so many different things that you can do, you know, lighting, sound, cinematography, wardrobe, yes. you know, creative producer, line producer. There's so many different aspects of a film set, you know, mm -hmm. and actually getting on that film set, you get an opportunity as a as a, a volunteer or a PA to say, hey, you know what? I actually came on here wanting to do this, but I kind of like that better. But let's go back to your childhood. <laughs> for, yeah, for, That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's go back to your childhood childhood because i understand that your dad uh was in radio yeah that's and right so yes. so you kind of got you kind of got set up for what you're doing now by by watching yeah. him yeah that's true yeah and i'm very thankful for the opportunities that i had as a child as well watching my dad do what he did in radio and uh, he had his own recording studio as well because he did a lot of voiceovers and so uh, my sister and I would often go to his studio, you know, in, in the summer when we didn't have school and we'd fool around with all his uh, audio equipment and recording equipment. And that was a great experience for me as a young child that I think a lot of kids never had that opportunity, you know, to, to be able to fool around with and play around with like real equipment, like these weren't toys, right? So 
that I think was was really cool. And just the way that my my parents encouraged me and my creativity as well was huge. So yeah, you're right. I, I did start really early on um, knowing that I wanted to do something creatively. Absolutely. So let me ask you a question. Um, with your father being in radio, do you think that that played a role in you when you first started out starting in sound? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because that's really what I thought I was going to do. You know, I just thought that that would be my career would be working in sound, you know, um, like audio post, you know, recording voiceovers, that kind of thing. And yeah, absolutely. It did. Because even I remember as a little kid, I had a tape recorder, and I would make all kinds of, you know, tapes, these were, you know, cassette tapes back in the day. And, uh, um, but yeah, so that's definitely a big part of why I thought that sound would be what I wanted to do. And what really got me started was with sound. And I never even had imagined that I would do anything behind the camera for, for a number of years until I had work in sound. So I, yeah, you're absolutely right. Having that um, experience working um, with my dad's recording equipment absolutely set me up for that big time. So when did the shift come about going from sound to videographer, uh, DP, when did that happen? Uh, that would have been probably, was probably about 2005, six, maybe. Um, so I had, I'd moved to Ontario by that time uh, with my, my parents, with my family and, uh, there were some opportunities for me to do some things with video. Uh, my dad had some ideas of some videos he wanted to make, uh, teaching videos and training videos, that kind of thing. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to help him with that. And I told him, I'm like, well, I don't really know too much about it, but, you know, let's let's go for it. And I did. And, uh, you know, honestly, they weren't that great. Um, but. Um, it was a learning opportunity for me. And it was, uh, you know, from there, some people saw that I was doing that. And I have, I would have friends who would ask me to do videos with them. We entered uh, like those like 24 hour film competitions and things like that, just for fun. Um, and that was uh, something new for me, but it, it helped me to realize that maybe there's some opportunity for me there so yeah it was just you know honestly it was an opportunity that presented itself and i just went for it <laughs> to really oh, oh okay so now you you start shooting video mm -hmm. and as you said you know with that being something very new uh the quality is not that good because you're learning as you go so when did you yeah. start shooting your own film because i understand that you you also made some short films so when did you yeah. start doing that yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I, uh, after fooling around with video for a few years, I decided that I'd need some formal training in that. So I went to college uh, back in 2010. And after that, I was able to apply for some um, serious video jobs. And I ended up working for um, a company that did a lot of online promotional videos for businesses. And uh, so I got started doing a lot of corporate videos. And to be honest, I really enjoyed it. It's, it doesn't matter if it's corporate videos or if I'm shooting a short film or what it is. It, it was just that I was working, shooting and editing things. And I was really enjoying that. And uh, so that's what I was doing as a job. But in my spare time, I would, um, you know, do short films and things like that as a way of doing things more creative. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I was able to do a few of those. But to be honest, this uh, feature film that I directed was the first time that I had ever directed a, uh, a feature. And anytime I had really honestly directed like a, a serious film that wasn't me just fooling around and making a project just for fun. 
and I was primarily like my bread and butter, so to speak, was uh, the corporate world and the corporate videos. And this opportunity to direct this feature film really just kind of came out of nowhere. So I, I didn't really have the extensive background in in film, in short films for that matter, or any films prior to that. So other than just fooling around. Okay, so let's let's talk about that because that's why we're here. Because you get you you put out an ad because you started your own production company. You put yeah. out an ad um, for your services as a videographer, mm -hmm. and you get an email from someone saying, "Hey, yeah. I'd like for you to shoot my feature film." Yeah, yeah. Script exactly. script is coming. So you yeah. get this email, you read it. What was your reaction to that? Wow. Well, my first reaction was I was very skeptical. Um, I wasn't sure if it was legit, if I should just delete the email and forget about it. Uh, but for some reason, after considering, you know, whether or not I should even give it any thought. I had a feeling that it might actually be something worth looking into. And I thought, well, I'll at least look into it. And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, then it's not no, no uh, big commitment or anything. Mm -hmm. I'll just check it out, find out more. But yeah, my initial thought was definitely, I was very skeptical and uh, very doubtful that it was um, something legit and something that I would uh, be interested in, to be honest. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. No, I was going to say, like you said, it was literally just an email with one sentence that just said, you know, I've got an idea for a film, the script is coming, and uh, that was it, didn't have any more information about it, so I didn't have a lot to go with. Okay, yeah, because in this business, you run into a lot of scammers and con artists, and to mm -hmm. get an email out of the blue like that, you're sitting there like, I don't know. So yeah. you, you decide to go with your gut. Yeah. So what was your next step? So the next step was for me to have a meeting with this gentleman who mm -hmm. had sent me the email. Because I thought, I would like to see who this person is. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know that they can actually show up for a meeting and get them to put in a little bit of effort to come to meet with me to show that they're serious about it. So the person lived in Niagara Falls or, or was, was living at the time, Niagara Falls. He didn't live there permanently, but he was there. And so Niagara Falls from where I live, is like a good hour and a half drive mm -hmm. and you know i thought that's a bit of a bit of a drive for me to make um not knowing anything about this i didn't want to you know waste my time so i told him let's meet halfway and i figured that'll be a good you know bit of a test to see if he's really serious if he shows up so uh you know i draw i started driving and i thought to myself well, you know what am i getting myself into here <laughs> right um and uh, but the guy showed up and uh we met at a uh, we, we met over a, a coffee at, at a restaurant and he showed up and he started talking to me about this film he wanted to make and i found out very quickly that he was very serious about this and this was really legit and he believed that I was the right guy for the job. And I had this incredible opportunity and I had this decision that I had to make if I was going to accept, you know, his, his offer and be a part of this project or not. And he asked me to spend a weekend with him um, because he said that he was, that's how he does business. He said, he, he said, he's a businessman. He said, in the business world, we get to know people. We do business deals on the golf course or at a barbecue, right? So he said, come out to my place and we'll, you know, we'll get a barbecue going and we'll sit around in the back patio and we'll chat. Mm 
that's that's how I would like to talk and I'll get to know about you and you know we'll learn about each other he said I, I'd rather do a talk business in that kind of environment casual environment than, a, than in an office or a boardroom or something setting and that's that was his comfort zone but I wasn't really prepared to uh you know, go spend a weekend with this total stranger quite, quite yet. So, you know, I said, well, let's, I'll have this meeting first. We'll talk about it and I'll let you know. Um, and, uh, you know, after we met, I still wasn't 100% sure, to be honest, but I had enough information to know what it was he wanted to do. And I thought to myself, well, let's just go with this as long as, as I can and see where it goes, what happens, and if it actually is is going to happen or not. And uh, uh, it ended up being, you know, a crazy adventure for me, but I had to be willing to take that chance. So I'm going to ask you a personal question, Matt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you married? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I think you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. And I know you told your wife, so you tell your wife, hey, hun, I got this email and it's asking me to make a feature film, but it gets better. He wants me to meet him where he is an hour and a half away. And then after the meeting, but hun, it gets better. He wants me to come spend a weekend with him. And this is right. a guy that I just met out the blue. Right. And I'm not trying to get in your business, but I would love to know what your wife had to say about everything that had transpired up until this point because again you know living the world that we live in mm -hmm. things happen yes. so when when you told her about the email and then the fact that mm -hmm. uh the gentleman and let's give this gentleman a name i'm so sorry the oh, yeah, gentleman's sorry. name yeah. is mark his name, gentleman's is, mark name is mark schneider yeah that's um, right sorry i should have mentioned his that. name is yes. mark schneider mm -hmm. um so what did your wife have to say about all of this wow well that's a great question. You know, to be honest, my wife has always been very supportive mm -hmm. and has always encouraged me to pursue, you know, different creative endeavors. And I think she did share the same level of, you know, skepticism, perhaps, um, or, or ca being cautious, you know, that I felt from the start. But at the same time, she understood that it has the potential, at least, to be an exciting opportunity for me. And, uh, you know, let's see where it goes, kind of a thing. Um, you know, I, we weren't signing anything, you know, on the dotted line, so to speak. I wasn't committing to anything quite yet, but I was just mostly curious, and she was too, and, and she was very supportive of that. So I'm thankful that she was uh willing to um let me go ahead with it for sure okay good because i'm yeah. I'm, I'm imagining if she had said no we wouldn't be sitting here talking about you having made this film <laughs> that's very likely Floyd. yes yeah. that's very likely but i'm i'm grateful that i didn't have to try to convince her that it was something that i wanted to do because um, she, like I said, she was supportive of the idea from the start, although, you know, to the same degree that I was, I should say, you know, we weren't, we weren't, uh, jumping in, you know, with, uh, you know, both feet at first, but, um, she was, uh, okay with me, um, uh, exploring it at the start and seeing where it goes. So okay. we did. Mm -hmm. So you, you end up meeting with Mr. Snyder and yeah. I, he, he tells you about the film. So. What what is the title of the film and and what is the oh, yeah. story about? Yes, so the title is called "What If It Was Me," which is a title that Mark had uh, chosen right from the start. And uh, Mark is uh, was from uh, Warminster, Pennsylvania, and he had a family friend who was a football player in high school. And uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, around that time, and became very well known um, because he was an exceptional talent, an exceptional athlete. And there was quite a, a buzz about him, um, especially in the local newspapers and the local media. And people understood that this young man, whose name was Buddy Miley, had a real future 
in professional sports as a football player um, and could, could potentially be a big star. Tragically, uh, this uh, man, Buddy, uh, was playing uh, football and was injured in a game. He was hit from behind and he fell awkwardly on his head and his neck and uh, sustained a spinal cord injury, which caused him to be paralyzed from the neck down. So he literally couldn't move his arms or legs, couldn't do anything, couldn't feed himself. He could move his head and that's it. And was bedridden. And it was a, a shock really to the, the community because Buddy had, was really like a superstar really in, in Warminster and around that area. And to have him go from having so much potential to you know, losing it all and having his dreams, you know, taken from him so quickly was so tragic. And uh, Buddy had a younger brother named Jimmy, Jimmy Miley. And Jimmy was also uh, a very talented athlete, very gifted. And uh, he played baseball and was actually uh, so good at baseball that he was drafted three times um, in the major leagues. Three different teams wanted him. But he kept turning them down because he wasn't sure if he was ready to leave home and leave his brother who was at home bedridden and he had um, an opportunity where he went and he played for the la dodgers for a while went to their training camp and, and played with them but the whole time he was there all he could think about was his brother buddy at home in bed and he felt a sense of guilt really that that jimmy you know that he had this opportunity to be a professional athlete and his brother didn't and he felt his brother was more deserving than he was so he literally walked away from his pro baseball career and went home back in those days there wasn't a lot of medical options for somebody who was paralyzed from the neck down you know they would send you home basically to, to let your family take care of you mm. and that's what they did so jimmy and his mom were the ones taking care of Buddy and, and Buddy depended on them, you know, for everything. And so for Jimmy to to walk away and, and from his baseball career and go home and take care of his brother just was a sign of how much he loved his brother and how much Buddy meant to him. And it got to the point though where Buddy was such a burden on his family that he struggled with that big time and had a lot of, uh, you know, mental struggles going on in his mind about whether or not he actually even had the will to continue to live. And, you know, suicide is such a, can be such a hard thing, you know, and, and for him, it was so real and he just couldn't bear it any longer. And he wanted a way to end not only his own suffering, but the, the suffering he felt he was imposing on his family. Mm -hmm. But he literally was powerless to do anything. Like he couldn't even take his own life if he wanted to because he was paralyzed. He needed somebody to help him with that. And he didn't have anyone else to turn to. He actually went to his brother, Jimmy, and said, will you help me? And here's Jimmy who walked away from a professional baseball career to take care of his brother. And now his brother saying, I would like you to help me to end my life. Mm. And so, you know, Jimmy was like, no, absolutely not. He didn't, he didn't want any part of that at first, but, you know, over time he saw the, you know, that it was really what buddy wanted. And, and Jimmy just loved his brother so much. He would do anything for him, like literally anything. And they had tried so many different, uh, you know, means to, to look into options for him to be able to walk again and, and to be healed. And they, they traveled around the world. They traveled to different countries and seen all kinds of specialists and things like that. And nothing was working. And Jimmy and Buddy both realized that he was never going to walk again. It wasn't yeah. going to happen. And so Jimmy agreed to do that for him. And, uh, you know, they looked at, you know, 
what was available at the time, which was in the news, they'd heard about Dr. Jack Kevorkian, who was uh, uh, known for helping people to end their lives. And it, he had gotten a lot of publicity. He was in the news. He was on talk shows. So people knew about him. And, and Jimmy was able to get in touch with him and ask him to give Buddy his final wish. But everything had to be done secretly because it was illegal. Mm. And they could have literally gone to jail, you know, or Jimmy could have been uh, put in jail and could have been, you know, uh, charged with murder and uh, things like that. It was it had to be all undercover. They couldn't tell their mom. They couldn't tell their family or anything. So this this kind of undercover operation had to take place in order for them to pull it off. And they were able to do it in the end. And, and Jimmy was able to give Buddy his final wish. And, wow. Um, so that's the story that, that Mark presented to me and said, you know, these, these brothers, you know, they were my friends growing up. You know, I grew up with this family. I saw the struggles firsthand. I was there. And I've always told them that someday I'm going to share your story with the world. And Mark said to me, he said, I'm ready to do that now. He said, I'm... Um, you know, I've been a businessman all my life. I understand business, marketing, everything like that. And he said, I'm at a place where I'm ready to finance this film myself. I just need somebody like you who knows how to make a movie mm. <laughs> to to help me to do it, to do the, you know, the the shooting and editing and the the production side of things. And he would handle the business end of things and that we would do it together. And so... It, it, it's a really a powerful story, and I thought it was an incredible opportunity for me to be part of something that meant a lot to a lot of people, to both to Mark and to the Maya family as well. Wow. So who actually wrote the script? Because um, earlier we were talking about the fact that he sent you an email and said the script would be ready. So who did he actually get to write the story? Yeah, well, Mark was familiar with the story uh, because he was there mm -hmm. and he experienced a lot of this firsthand and he had talked to Jimmy a lot over the years about everything that went on behind the scenes and things that people didn't know. So Mark knew the story. So he was, he provided the story, I should say, but he did hire, uh, excuse me, a, a gentleman to uh, do like a treatment, okay, uh, a rough draft if you will of the script um he hired a, a script writer who knew very little or, or you know nothing really about the story other than what mark gave him and he just took that and, and mark typed it all out like a word okay. document handed him a word document and basically said make this into a script wow. and so we got something back but that wasn't really the script that we used it was something to start with so Mark took that and, um, you know, tweaked it, made it, made changes as he uh, felt would would best represent the brothers and their story and the story also that Mark wanted to tell. And uh, and so I would say Mark really was primarily the driving force behind the script. OK, yeah, because I, I was curious about that because, you know, with 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 Mark not having any experience in the industry. I was just curious as to who actually put it, you know, right. on paper so that you guys, because you need it, you need a script on, on set. You need the script, you need something <laughs> to actually learn the lines from. So I was very curious about that. So you, yeah. you get, I'm sorry, please. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, uh, Mark, really what he was good at doing was telling the story. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to this actual script, you're talking about, writing in camera shots and writing in actors, you know, facial expressions or things like the actors movements and things, or even establishing shots. That was something that Mark wasn't able to do or wouldn't have uh, even thought of in a lot of cases. So uh, I also um, worked with Mark on that as well. So I would tell Mark things like, you know, you can't have three scenes back to back in in buddy's bedroom you know one after another that happened like you know days apart from each other you need something in between to break it up so that we know that it's it's the next day or something like that right and those kind of little things or 
continuity things, right? So that if somebody is, uh, you know, somebody was driving somewhere that, you know, they are where they were driving to in the next scene or those kind of little continuity things as well. So I did have some input um, that way, always thinking in the back of my mind that we're going to have to actually shoot this thing and to make sure that it's actually going to work and that it's going to look good on screen. So there were some, I, I did have some input, but there was a lot of input as well that we had on the day when we were shooting and the actors would, uh, you know, give their own input into the, the characters as well. So I definitely have to give them some credit uh, in, the, in that as well. It was definitely, uh, you know, a, a bit of a collaboration, I should say, on the script. So you've never directed a feature film. Mm -hmm. You get an email to, to, to direct a film then you find out what this film is about. Mm. And this is your first directorial debut <laughs> of a feature film mm -hmm. with a few heavy subject matters. Yeah. Uh, death by suicide or euthanasia, as some would like to say. Mm -hmm. um, the story of a paraplegic Mm -hmm. And the story of everything that happens to his family, both physically and mentally, because I'm sure this took a toll over the years. Oh, and yeah. this is your first director directorial debut. Mm -hmm. And this lands in your lap. Right. Th th there's a quote from a gentleman that I follow by the name of Ed Milet. And he says, things don't happen to you. They happen for you. Mm. Do you think that this particular type of film, as heavy as it was, happened for you for a reason? Wow. Yes, yes, I do believe that. Um, you know, I don't always understand everything. You know, I ask myself so many times, like, why me? Why was I the one who had this opportunity? and not somebody else, you know, who may have been more qualified. And you think about all the tens of thousands of people even around where I live who do what I do and who would love to have this opportunity. And people who dream of someday directing a feature film someday in their life, and they may or may not ever have that chance. And I thought to myself, how did I get this chance? Or why did I get this opportunity and I don't really honestly know the answer but I do believe that it was the right opportunity for me and that I was for whatever reason the right person you know for that and I'd like to think that somehow I was able to tell the story um, and when I say tell the story I mean present the story visually in this film in a way that is in a way like uh, something that I would do that maybe somebody else wouldn't perhaps. And uh, I think that for some, whatever reason, I had this opportunity and I felt a great sense of responsibility as well. You know, that I had a responsibility to honor the story, but yeah, I do believe that there was a reason. I'm just not sure exactly what it was, but I believe that it all worked together. And I think everything up to that I'd experienced in my life up to that point in some way had led me there. You know, the fact that I had started out being willing just to volunteer, you know, and some people, they wait for opportunities to come to them before they take that first step. But I was willing to go out and volunteer and that's how I got started. And then this opportunity came to me and I'm sure there's a lot of people that would have had this chance that I had and thought, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, who is this guy? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna respond to this email, but just the, the fact that I was crazy enough to give this guy a chance and let, listen to him. Um, I think that that's a reason also why I ended up having the opportunity just because I was willing to take a chance. But it's not really about me. And I, I don't want to, 
you know, sound like I'm blowing my own horn because I think that I'm, I'm blessed to have had this opportunity that came to me for whatever reason. And I can't take credit really for having created this opportunity for myself um, too much, um, you know, because it's not like this was a film that I uh, had wanted to make on my own. It's something that really came to me. So I, I'm thankful that I had the chance. And I'm wondering when Mark reached out to you, had he researched other directors, more seasoned directors, and as a businessman decided that when he saw you, and I'm sure he looked you up because he sounded mm -hmm. like a very shrewd businessman. So I'm sure he, he looked was. you up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if he said, I think I'm going to go with Matt because Matt has never done something like this before. So Matt would be more open to what I'm suggesting. Whereas right. a veteran director, being a veteran, mm -hmm. would probably have given Mr. Snyder a lot of pushback. Well, I wouldn't do it like this. Well, you really mm -hmm. don't want to do it like that. Whereas with you, hey, you know what? This is my first time. I'm a veteran at this, but this is my first time doing a feature film. So I'm open to ideas. I'm open to hearing what others have to say in order to make this the best project possible. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and, and you're right, Mark was a very shrewd businessman and he had told me um, later on as we were working together that he had looked me up back in the beginning and he told me that. So you're absolutely right. He said to me, he's like, Matt, I know, I know about you. I know your background. I know, you know what you've done in the past. So he did his research and I never did ask him if he had uh, approached other directors or, uh, you know, other individuals, but I'd like to think that he probably did, you know, and just even I look at the way he went about, you know, the casting and things like that. And he, he did consider a lot of options before making decisions. So I'd like to think that, that there were, uh, other people that, uh, he had considered, but he always told me that he believed that was the right person for the job. Mm -hmm. even at times when I wasn't quite so sure of myself, <laughs> you know, there were times and um, he kept telling me, you know, uh, that he believed I was the right person. So, uh, and in, in the end it worked out. So I guess he was right. Yeah. He, 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 uh, he weighed the pros and the cons and took that and looked yeah. at that risk assessment and said, you know yeah. what, Matt checks all the boxes. So we're going to go mm -hmm. with Matt. But let's talk a little bit about the casting, because I was listening to an interview with you and uh, he I, you, you talked about the, the casting for the film and how he actually approached some of the actors in the film. So can you talk about that, please? Yes, for sure. Uh it was a true story, like I've mentioned. So these are real people that we're wanting to represent on the screen. And so the, the choice of actors was very important because uh, they needed to represent people that Mark was very close to and had very vivid you know, memories of and how they, they acted and things like that, how they looked. So there wasn't a lot of room to be creative like you would in a fictional story about the characters. So Mark had a very specific look in mind for the, the two brothers specifically. And with them being athletes, you know, these, these had to be, uh, you know, big, strong, athletic people, you know, men to play these two brothers. And, uh, and they also had to look you know, the part in terms of, uh, you know, the hairstyles and things like that, because Buddy was actually known for having long hair when he mm. played football and the hair would, you know, come out of his the back of his football helmet. And back in the 70s, that was something that people thought was was unusual. Right. So those were little things that were important to Mark. 
and uh, you know Jimmy too he had a big you know curly head of hair too and Mark was very particular about that in fact he had the actor make sure that he grew his hair out and no more haircuts once he was casted you know that kind of thing so the look was really important to Mark and that was the first thing he looked for to be honest was the look and I remember he would go online and different websites where actors had posted their headshots and he would just look at headshots and, and find that look and that's what he wanted and it was funny though because he took the same approach to the casting as he did with me and when he found an actor that he wanted to consider for the role he would invite them out to his place to again spend a weekend come out to my place on a friday for a barbecue and let's uh, hang out together you know which was a very unconventional way to to cast but you know i understand it makes sense it's a great way to get to know somebody um but for the actors they weren't used to that and they i remember one of the actors was a little bit more than a little bit uh skeptical and approached me was like please tell me what's going on with this guy because he's inviting me to his <laughs> place for a weekend um what type so of movie was, are we shooting? What type of movie I are we know, shooting? Exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was especially awkward with the female yeah. uh, characters, right? Um, you know, but it's funny because when I, I eventually did go out and, and uh, visit him there, I didn't spend a weekend, but I did go out and visit him there for a day on a Saturday. And, you know, his wife was there and his two sons and his family, and they had friends over. And I was like, okay, the, if you would have told me that there was going to be other people, you know, your wife and your family and right you know the navy had the neighbors over for supper while i was there stuff like that it's like would you know at least make me a little bit more comfortable but you know stuff like that he he, he didn't think about those those things it was just come on come over and meet me but that was his approach to casting it was really about getting to know the people and spending time with them finding out who they were as a person and there there wasn't the the usual audition tapes or you know table reads or any of those kind of things it was he his approach to casting was the same way he did he did business business deals with people you know if he liked you as a person then he was willing to do business with you and i thought it was a, quite a fascinating way of doing the casting but it it made a lot of sense in some ways as unconventional as it was so how did that translate onto the set you know as unconventional as mr schneider was and his approach to getting this film made. How did that um, translate onto the set and, and how did the actors um, receive that? Were, were, they, were they comfortable once they met him and got to know him and then they got on set? Um, how did things go once you guys got on set and started shooting? Yeah, well, the actors were phenomenal. Like, I've got to say that the casting what couldn't have been any better. They did an outstanding job and were incredible to work with as well. And, and Mark himself, he wasn't even Mark Schneider, who we're talking about here. He, he was only on set for, I don't know, three or four days, mm. maybe five days at most, um, because he had you know, a business to run and he was traveling. He was literally all over the world, He'd be in Hong Kong or Panama or, you know, Florida at any given day while we were filming. And so he wasn't always around. So, but when he was around, uh, everyone got along great with him. Like he's a very likable guy and the actors uh, were very comfortable working for him and with him. And I, I've got to give them a lot of credit because they, the actors absolutely went above and beyond. They certainly made my job a lot easier. And, uh, you know, we all understood, the actors included, that this was not going to be a conventional, you know, film shoot in any way, really. Like, I like to say that we, we broke all the rules and we made this movie. We, we pretty much did everything that they tell you in film school not to do. We pretty much did the opposite of what you're supposed to do. And, but the actors were great. They were so easygoing and uh, very flexible and, and being willing to just do whatever was asked of them. A lot of times they would uh, have their input into different scenes and they were 
an absolute pleasure to work with. Uh, the, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better cast for sure. Great. So mm -hmm. some 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 things ended up transpiring with the film before you guys were able to actually show it. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you 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 finish the film, the film's in a can, your friend goes to that was crazy. He goes to Panama to edit this thing, which was yeah. I, I I heard I was like, wow, really? When does that yeah, happen? Just when you think right, just when you think it couldn't get any more weird. When the film is, is finished, Mark was in Panama at the time. And you know, it was it's cold here, it's winter. He's like, I'm not coming to Canada to sit in the it on the editing when it's freezing cold. Send the editor here to Panama and we'll edit here at my house. And that's what he did. He flew the editor out. Panama and put him up in his house and he stayed there for like a month and and edited the, the film there and, and you know with Mark over his shoulder <laughs> you know it's crazy wow wow but, yeah but but you're right when it was finished we had this we had this amazing story you know and this this film that was just it's unbelievable how it came to be and I was so excited about what we had accomplished you know, that we pulled it off, <laughs> you know, it's crazy. And that so many different obstacles that we faced during the filming and things like that. And, but we pulled it off and we, we did 10 different, there was 10 different versions of this film before Mark signed off on a final edit. It had been edited and, and scenes rearranged and scenes shortened and lengthened and scenes cut out and things like that. And finally it was done and Mark was, uh, ready to release it and he had a plan to release it um, on his own uh, platform that he was developing and he had a web web developer building a, a streaming uh, website for him to release the movie on and Mark was in Hong Kong on business and he woke up one morning and he couldn't move he was paralyzed and he literally rolled over um, out of his bed and was laying on the ground and he couldn't speak the language and he, he was alone. He thought he was going to die. Mm. And his wife was at home in Florida, hadn't heard from him, had a feeling something was up, called his uh, assistant there in Hong Kong and said, go check on Mark. She went to his uh, place where he was staying and opened the door and he was laying there on the floor paralyzed and was literally like within hours of uh, of losing his life. And so she uh, rushed him to a hospital and uh, found out that he had a, an infection in his spinal cord that had spread. And he didn't know it was there all this time. Mm -hmm. And as crazy as it was, Mark here now was, he had just made a film about a man who was paralyzed and now Mark couldn't move his legs and was bedridden. And he's like, how crazy is this that I'm literally living the same experience as the character in my film? And Mark eventually was able to get some uh, very good medical help and was to regain some, able to regain some movement in his legs. And through that experience, though, he it opened his eyes to uh, people who have uh, spinal cord injuries or paralysis and can't move uh, their arms or their legs, can't walk. And he gained a new appreciation for what they're going through, even more so, and, and made connections with people, um, you know, social media influencers and things like that who had, uh, you know, varying degrees of uh, paralysis or spinal cord injuries. And so Mark decided at that moment, he wanted to give back to these people he wanted to help them out because he was able to get access to medical care as he needed it, but not everybody was. And he understood that there's people out there who, who just don't have the ability to get medical attention that they need for one reason or another. And he wanted to help them out. So he decided that he would use the, the funds raised from this film to give back to spinal cord research. Hmm. And the whole um, focus of, uh, what he wanted to do with this film shifted in that moment. Instead of it being strictly a business venture, it became really a, a way for him to give back. And uh, he wanted to create a, a whole movement through this. Uh, what if it was me, you know, was going to be the, the title of this. And, and he wanted to make more films to tell more stories and 
help people to tell their story and spread the words that create awareness for the average person who might not be aware of the, the challenges that these people are facing. So it, he um, was well on his way to making that happen and make a lot of connections and a lot of partnerships and things. And suddenly out of nowhere, I got a message from Mark's wife that he had passed away suddenly. And I believe it oh, was wow. um, a heart issue of cardiac arrest or something of wow. that nature. And just as things were ramping up and there was a lot of excitement, everything was put on hold, you know, it's like hitting the stop button and that was the end of it. And I honestly had no idea what, what was going to happen. And at first, like we were stopping, but it wasn't so much a permanent, you know, this is done. It was really a question mark. What's going to happen now? You know, as Mark was really the driving force behind all of this, he was such a visionary. And, uh, you know, talking with, you know, his family and everything, they, they had a lot to deal with, with Mark's passing, you know, with him being, a, you know, a businessman, he had, he was such a creative visionary man, he had all kinds of different business uh, ideas and ventures and things that he was always doing. And so they, his family really had their hands full, but the film has always been something that, you know, talking that, that I believe that in, in my experience talking with his family, that they would like to share with the world mm -hmm. and they would like to have a means of sharing it and allow people to watch it, you know, not just for Mark's sake, but for Buddy and Jimmy, you know, for their sake too. You know, for, for Buddy Miley, Jimmy Miley, their story, you know, is a powerful story. And uh, it's one that, you know, Mark's family and, and myself, you know, and we believe it should be shared. And so it, it did, um, you know, it kind of like took the wind out of our sails, you know, so to speak, for a while. We weren't sure what to do with it. The film sat on the shelf for, it's been five years now. Nobody mm -hmm. really has seen only a few people that Mark had shown it to, you know, in some early screenings had seen it. And, um, but I, I, you know, I talked, talked to Mark's, uh, you know, his, his family, his wife and everything. And, you know, I, I said to them, I said, you know, it'd be nice just to honor the you know the family and and the people who have put their time and their effort into this film to have like a local screening that we mm -hmm. can do just to share it with the community um because it, it's a story that, that takes place around you know the philadelphia you know community in warminster in that area um and so there's a definite connection there and there's also a connection for uh, where i live here in ontario canada mm -hmm. because the film was made here and uh, the cast and the crew and everybody, you know, we live here. And, and so I did, uh, uh, I was able to show it here and uh, as a local, a locally made film, not the story necessarily didn't have the, the local connection as it does, you know, with somebody like you or people in Philadelphia, but it had the local connection because it was made locally and, and you know, that I had directed and so forth. So I was able to show it here and it was great for our community people to come out and watch it and um, to get excited about a film that was made here in southwestern Ontario in Woodstock where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and and so people, you know, they, they really uh, appreciated that and they had a lot of good uh, feedback from the people who came out and watched it. It was just a small, you know, local theater and I appreciated that their support and everything as well helping to accommodate us wasn't like a big, uh, wasn't too big of an event. Um, but, you know, Jimmy Miley, uh, it was really important to me that he be there for that. Mm -hmm. So he came here from Philadelphia and was here at the, at the screening. <clears throat> and, uh, and he and I, you know, said that it'd be great to do something for his friends and, and family there. And, and really anybody who, who, in Philadelphia who wanted to come out and watch it as well. 
because as much as, as the film was made here um, and, you know, could be seen as a, a Canadian film, perhaps because it was made in Canada. Right. It really is. It really is a story that resonates with with that community there in Warminster and, and really the, the the greater area around Philadelphia, because Buddy was known around the local media, you know, and, and so Jimmy and I are planning to do a screening uh, late next month. I believe it's uh, the 23rd. It's a Thursday. And uh, they're in, uh, in the Warminster area. And uh, we haven't got everything finalized yet in terms of the, uh, the tickets and so forth and how people can attend it. But we have a Facebook page uh, for the film. So if, uh, if, if you would like to find out more, you can go on Facebook. And if you just search for What If It Was Me Movie, that's the name of the, the Facebook page, What If It Was Me Movie, uh, I'm going to post updates on there. Um, as there's uh, as they become available, if uh, anyone in the area there in Philadelphia would like to attend, would like to watch this and to come out and to meet Jimmy and to show your support for him and this amazing story that he has to share, because you know I've gotten to know Jimmy over this experience and he is such an amazing man and has such a warm heart and. The love that he had for his brother, you know, is, is something that I don't think anybody could ever, um, you know, compare it to anything else, you know, really, wow. because for him to be so selfless for what he did for, for his brother. Um, and, and so it'd be great to support him in this and to do this for, for him and for the local community there in Warminster. So stay tuned. Um, That'll be happening at the end of the month, uh, next month, and, and I'll post uh, updates on our Facebook page as they become available. And also, as far as the future of the film goes, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's our desire, you know, myself and, and uh, Mark's uh, family, it's our desire to share the story somehow. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that will look like, um, whether it be, you know, through uh, one of the mainstream, uh, you know, streaming media you know netflix amazon or one of those something like that or mm -hmm. or something else we're not sure but we're definitely open to options we're definitely pursuing uh, any opportunity that may be out there and uh you know hoping that that uh you know th there'll be some interest and i appreciate you floyd having me as a guest on your show and giving me <clears throat> sorry an opportunity to to share this story and, and not only my personal story, but the story of this film, because it's so much bigger than me. And I'm hoping that people who are watching this right now and anybody who might come out to, to watch the film will, you know, uh, um, hopefully get, catch the vision that Mark had originally. And there'll be someone or, or some people out there who can help to carry out Mark's vision in some way. That's really, uh, would, would be amazing if we can somehow uh, achieve that. Mm. See, Mark knew, Mark knew what he was doing when he chose you. He, he, <laughs> Mark knew what he was doing yeah. when, when he chose you. Uh, you know, he yeah, was a well, very yeah. forward thinking, forward mm -hmm. visionary mm -hmm. type of person. So he knew he that uh, having you direct his film, that it, that it would be in good hands. But this this has been absolutely amazing. So what's what's next on your plate besides the screening next month? Oh well, yeah. Um, you know, I'm 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 continuing. Uh, you know, my business as a freelance. Uh, you know, videographer really. Um, you know, shooting, directing, editing, uh, films. You know, projects. A lot of again, I I haven't uh, haven't completely walked away from you know, what I was doing before with the corporate mm -hmm. world as well, doing corporate videos and things. And a lot of the same people that I was uh, working for before, um, you know, I continue to work for them. I've, uh, I've built a lot of connections over the years. So, uh, you know, I just uh, continue with that with my own uh, business, um, which is called Power Web Media. And, uh, you know, you can find me online 
powerwebmedia.com if you want to know what I'm up to. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, you know, in a way it's kind of crazy because my, my life in, in some ways has kind of gone back to, you know, quote unquote normal mm -hmm. in a way since this film was finished, I went back to doing what I was doing before the film, which was just as a freelancer is working for, you know, different, uh, opportunities as they arise. But, you know, I've had the opportunity to work some, with some amazing people and some amazing local filmmakers here in in southwestern Ontario and there's a, a lot of talented filmmakers here in Canada and uh, the people I've gotten to meet and gotten to work with uh, had the had the pleasure and the honor of working with uh, over the past five years since this film was was completed um, have have just been uh, you know incredible and I'm so happy that for the opportunities that I've had and the people that I've been able to connect with and just the artistic people that, that we have in our community and even you know people like you floyd who help to um uh help to sp um, spread the word you know about different creative endeavors and give filmmakers a voice give them a platform to talk about what they're doing and to create awareness in the community about independent film so i appreciate that and uh, there's a lot of um as i'm sure you know a lot of talented uh independent filmmakers out there and uh, uh it's just you know a matter of having an opportunity to talk about our stories so thank you for that good good well again ladies and gentlemen i'm glad that you guys were able to sit in with myself and matt as we talked for about an hour about an, an absolutely amazing film that i cannot wait to see and i'll just say this matt get ready because once this hits uh your normal life may get a little hectic once people see <laughs> once people see this this piece of work because i'm sure that you guys did an, an absolutely amazing job so um other than facebook where can people find you are you on instagram or anything like that yep yeah sure thank you um yeah instagram again under my business which is power web media you can find me uh under that on instagram um and uh and like i said my website powerwebmedia.com um but yeah definitely uh stay tuned to the facebook page of the film what if it was me movie um and the, the facebook page i'm going to continue to update it that as we go and uh hopefully there'll be some uh, exciting news to share on that uh as we go but uh, um you know i believe you're right uh, it's just a matter of spreading the word and i think if people are aware of this film and people have the chance to watch it then uh, it will really impact them because it really is a powerful story well, I cannot wait to see it. Um, yeah, I, if I wasn't at a wedding, I would definitely attend because I'm only 40 minutes away from Warminster, so oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 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 really I'm really close. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. actually my wife and I with it we were there a couple of weeks ago because it's a really nice oh, wow. area. Yeah, mm. so when you say Warminster, okay. I'm like oh, I'm, I'm like a hop, skip, and a jump away from there. Yeah, so yeah. Um, hopefully okay. this you know when you guys come the first time, the the reception will will be so phenomenal that you'll have to come back and then do a tour so that I yeah. can uh, actually sit on, you know, stand on the red carpet yeah. with you guys and, uh, yeah, you know, watch, watch such an amazing film. But yeah, definitely. I'm sure there'll be another opportunity for you to see it. Absolutely. And, uh, and I'm planning to be there as well, uh, next month for the, for the screening as well. So I'm looking forward to that, but yeah, we'll, we'll make sure you have a chance to see it for sure. Okay. Awesome. Well, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, again, thank you guys so much for joining myself, myself and Matt Power, film director, and so much more on a conversation with And If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with your friends, because again, this is such an amazing story. And oftentimes the real stories are the best stories because as i used to say when i was writing nothing writes like real life nothing writes mm -hmm. like real life so uh, i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing this film and and please please give um jimmy's family the, the miley family my best in regards to this film and you know i really hope that they they get this thing out there uh so the masses can see it but again ladies and gentlemen if you like the episode share it Give us a follow on YouTube. Give us a follow on Apple Podcasts because we are going to be bringing you more amazing and phenomenal guests such as Mr. Matt Power. It was it was an absolute honor and a privilege to talk with you about this. And I'm so glad that you reached out to me uh, to uh, share this wonderful, heartbreaking, 
but wonderful story. So again, Matt, thank you so much for joining me on a conversation with, and as I always say at the end of the show, love it like a hobby, but above all else, treat it like a business. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, have an absolutely amazing night.